When archaeologists first uncovered them, they knew there was something special about the two cities. While so many ancient settlements around the world have a more organic, haphazard shape and form, the twin capitals of the Indus Valley in eastern Pakistan, the cities of Mahenjo-Daro and Harappa, looked entirely different. They were planned out. Instead of beginning life as a collection of small homes and growing over the centuries, these ancient cities were laid out along a grid pattern from the beginning. In a lot of ways, they look less like the sprawling maze of tiny streets that you might find in some parts of London and more like a rudimentary New York City. They are a memorial to one of humanity's oldest urges, to plan ahead. We love to map things out and see where it's all going. From daily planners that many of us keep on our desks to the strategy meetings that build the roadmaps for tech devices, feature films, and family road trips, people are planners. There's just one problem with that. The future is unpredictable. If you've been around on this planet for any amount of time, one of the key truths that becomes apparent is that we honestly have no idea what will happen next. We can hope. We can plan. We can dream up big and wonderful ideas. But the future isn't an open book, and more times than not, we'll be completely surprised. Except, well, there have been some throughout history who have disagreed. To them, the future was right there to examine, to know, to follow. Entire subcultures and religions were built around this idea, and for thousands of years, everyday people believed that it was all possible. So, can some people predict the future? Can individual human beings living in a certain time and place glimpse the things to come and give us all a preview? If the stories found in history are any indication, maybe. But seeing what's ahead of us can't always prevent disaster. I'm Aaron Mankey, and this is Lore. Let's spend a moment talking about language. Full confession, I love words. I love the way you can see their history, their DNA, right inside the letters. Words, if examined properly, can tell us stories. In ancient Greek, the word-forming element pro means in advance. So think of words we use today like provide or prologue, and you can see the hint of that story inside them. Now, another word in Greek is physian, which means to speak or to tell. Put them together and you get prophesian or prophecy, literally to tell things in advance. And that's the core of everything related to this idea of seeing the future. For thousands of years, long before recorded history gave us words like prophecy, there have been individuals in society all around the globe who served this purpose. And that root word buried inside the term, the one that meant to speak, holds another clue for us. Because for a very, very long time, prophecies were delivered orally, by speaking. Of course, these types of people have taken different titles and roles throughout history. Two of the most common terms you might bump into are prophets and oracles, but they aren't interchangeable. While prophets receive a word from the divine and then carry it out into the world for others to hear it, an oracle traditionally was someone you would go visit, ask a question, and then wait for an answer. And to make things more complicated, you might also hear or read about people who were called seers. And these were different yet. A seer, technically, is someone who reads the signs and makes a trained guess to the meaning behind them. Here's the best way that I can explain it. An oracle or a prophet receives text messages directly from a deity, while a seer just scrolls that deity's social media posts and draws conclusions from the general public things they say. They both had power in the ancient world, but hopefully you can see the differences between them. So how did prophets work? Well, that was a really mixed bag, and it all depended on where and when that prophet worked. And remember, this concept has always been global, so there are a lot of variations. Some prophets used involuntary dreams, while others used intentional meditation. A frequent element was some sort of substance that altered their perception of reality, like a powerful drug or an herb, whatever it would take to put the prophet in the right state of mind. 
Now, I mentioned oracles a couple of minutes ago, and if you've gotten even a basic understanding of the ancient Greek world, that term probably makes you think of the Oracle of Delphi. Delphi was a community located on the lower slope of Mount Parnassus, and it was the home of an ongoing group of prophetesses known as the Pythia. In some ways, the Pythia were sort of like priests or nuns. They dressed in special clothing, they lived apart from the rest of the community, and they worked at the temple there in Delphi, giving out prophecies to those who approached them. But some of the oracle's mystique and power certainly came from some, well, controlled substances. Historians are now pretty certain that the Pythia entered their trances through a mix of chewing on laurel leaves and inhaling the smoke from burning oleander. It was a pretty toxic mix, and so the Pythia would typically be pushed into some epileptic-like seizure, something the Greeks referred to as the sacred disease. It was this unnatural movement that convinced the Greeks that the Pythia were under the control of the god Apollo. And as she spoke, priests would scribble down the words that she said, regardless of whether or not they made sense. And then from those words, predictions would be made. Trippy? Absolutely. But it was also powerful, and it's a legacy that held on for thousands of years. But not all prophecy stayed in the ancient world. In fact, some of the most well-known examples happened much later. And I'd like to tell you about a couple. But you probably already saw that coming didn't you? There's the story you know and the actual truth, and sometimes they look very different from one another. And that's exactly the situation when it comes to the guy named Michel de Nostradamus, otherwise known to history as Nostradamus. Now, we don't know a ton about his early life. We know that he was born into a big family with close to 10 siblings and that he was considered incredibly bright. In fact, he was already studying at the University of Avignon by the young age of just 14, so not too shabby. About a year into his studies, though, the school shut down because a wave of the plague was raging across the countryside. So for the next eight years, he'd travel France, helping out where he could, and developed a reputation as a skilled apothecary, using herbs to help heal the sick. After that, life was a series of disappointments for him. He enrolled in medical school, but was expelled due to his work as an apothecary, something those stuffy, snobbish medical professors didn't approve of. He married in 1531, and they had two children, but the plague returned shortly after, and everyone but Nostradamus died. So, back to traveling for him. Roughly 15 years later, he was back in France, working as a physician's assistant, married again, and growing a new family. But he was also doing something else. He was writing an almanac, sort of a cross between an annual calendar and an astrology guidebook for the year to come. And wouldn't you know it, it took off in popularity, so he wrote another one. Soon people were writing to him asking for personal horoscopes, and he would send back replies. And along the way, he caught the attention of Catherine de' Medici, wife of Francis King Henry II. About a decade before he passed away, in 1566, he started publishing collections of prophecies. They were written in quatrains, a set of four rhyming lines, sort of like the verses in a pop song. Then they were organized into groups of 100, which is why they were called centuries. Not because they refer to a period of history, but because century literally means a group of 100. By the time he died, he had written nine centuries, or 9,000 quatrains, plus another 42 quatrains, so 942 prophecies. And how'd he do? Well, that depends on who you ask. In one quatrain, he wrote, The blood of the just will be lacking in London, burnt up in the fire of 66. The ancient lady will topple from her high place. Many of the same sect will be killed. Now, a lot of people see it as a prediction of the Great Fire of London in 1666, a century after he wrote it, right down to the statue of the Virgin toppling from the steeple of St. Paul's Cathedral. But most of his successful predictions, if we'll call them that, actually were post-dictions, meaning that they only seem to make sense looking backwards into history. Never mind the fact that most of the stuff Nostradamus wrote was actually lifted from the works of earlier historians, then just written out in a cryptic mixture of word games, multiple languages, and frustratingly nonspecific details. Still, if you mention predictions to just about anyone today, 
there's a high probability they'll think of one man, Nostradamus. But there's another figure to talk about as well. Thomas Learmont was a Scotsman born in the early part of the 13th century, down near the English border. Now, his story is even less documented than that of Nostradamus, but it has such a powerful and entertaining edge to it. Here's how it goes. Thomas was apparently taking a nap under a hawthorn tree when a beautiful woman in a green velvet dress rode up to him on a white horse. Naturally, she introduces herself as the queen of Elfland and motions to the back of the horse. You know, climb on and let's go for a ride, that sort of thing. So she rides off with him and straight into the alternate dimension that is Elfland. And for seven long years, Thomas parties it up there, becomes friendly with the locals, and really just sort of endears himself to the elves. But then the queen gives him some bad news. You see, typically they would sacrifice their seven-year guest to the devil, but they ended up liking Thomas a bit too much. So instead of killing him, they sent him back home to Scotland, and in the process, gifted him with the ability to see the future. Thomas is known today as Thomas the Rhymer, and his reputation pretty much hangs on one event. One day in 1286, Thomas apparently visited Dunbar Castle and told the Earl of March that Scotland's king, Alexander III, would fall off his horse and die. The very next day, that's exactly what happened. Kenneth was born on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides, on land that was owned by the Earl of Seaforth and part of the Mackenzie clan, which is why he's sometimes called Kenneth Mackenzie. Others referred to him by his Gaelic name, Cognac Orr. He wasn't much more than a common laborer, working hard for a living just like everybody else around him. But after his mother had a mysterious encounter in a graveyard, things began to change for him. It seems that one night she was out in the field near the church and noticed that all of the graves were open and the dead were walking about. After walking over to investigate, she could see all of them returning to their graves, all but one, and that dark, empty grave seemed like a curiosity to her. So she stood next to it, wondering where its occupant had gone, and that's when they walked up behind her. This ghostly revenant had apparently once been the daughter of a king of Norway, thus the long walk there and back to the grave. And when Kenneth's mother kindly stepped aside to let her return to the grave, she thanked her and gave her a blue stone with a hole through its center as a gift. A stone, she said, that would give her son the gift of prophecy. Over the years that followed, Kenneth's reputation grew, and soon he left the Isle of Lewis for the mainland, where he took on work for the Earl of Seaforth at Bran Castle. Which is why, as more and more people learned about his abilities, they began to refer to him as simply the Bran Seer. What could he do? Well, it seems that all he needed to do was lift that stone up to his eye and look straight through the hole down its center. Through it, he was able to see the future and then answer the questions that others asked of him. And he knew it worked too, because once, early on, he glanced through the stone and saw the wife of his foreman putting poison into his lunch. After she delivered it to him, he gave a bite to his dog as a test, and the poor animal quickly died. Over the years, he foresaw a number of key events. It said that he witnessed a vision of the Battle of Culloden and the discovery of oil in the North Sea, he also once stated that Scotland would never see the return of its own parliament unless people found the ability to walk across the channel between England and France. Amazingly, in 1994, the Channel Tunnel was open to the public, making the impossible possible. And five years later, the Scottish Parliament returned. The story and the life of the Bran Seer came to an end one day when he was summoned to Bran Castle, seat of the power of the Earl of Seaforth and his wife. It seems that the Earl had been traveling to Paris on a business trip, but had been gone so long that Lady Seaforth had begun to worry about her husband's safety. So she called for the famous Seer to come and shed some light on the situation. Kenneth was said to have gladly arrived to help out, and after being asked the question by the lady, he held his stone up to the light and looked down the center. A moment later, he lowered it and nodded, Yes, my lady, your husband is alive and well, and still in Paris. Lady Seaforth, though, was naturally relieved, but as Kenneth turned to go, she stopped him. Tell me more, she said. I would like to know why he has been gone for so long. 
Kenneth replied that she should be satisfied with his answer, but she begged for more detail. So reluctantly, he closed his eyes and told her everything else that he had seen through the stone. The Earl of Seaforth was indeed in Paris and had been inside a beautifully ornate room complete with velvet and silk, and he had been kneeling before a beautiful woman, one arm around her waist and the other lifting her hand to his lips. Enraged by the vision, Lady Seaforth screamed at him. How dare he say such slanderous things about the Earl? And before he could defend himself, she had him bound and carried from the castle out to nearby Shannon Re Point for an immediate execution. There on the shore of the water, where witches had been executed in centuries past, a large barrel of tar was set on fire. Kenneth didn't have to be a seer to know what was going to happen next, so it's said that he shouted one last prediction. When I look far into the future, he cried, I see the end of the house of Seaforth. Generations from now, it will all end in sorrow. And with that, he was dragged to the burning barrel and his head was dunked into the flaming liquid inside. It was an act as old as time and one that has never really gone away, although it might look different in modern times. When people in power don't like the truth, they are very good at silencing it. It's pretty clear why so many people are obsessed with knowing what the future holds. It's an idea that offers a bit of hope in the face of an uncertain world. We don't know what's just around the corner. It could be something good or something unfortunate. But whatever it is, I bet most of us would welcome a sneak peek. And I think that desire is something that ties us to our ancestors. We can go all the way back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest known literary work in the world, and see prophecy and visions of the future at work in the story. And we can pull up any number of films on our streaming apps and see the same thing. The future's tempting position, just out of our reach, is something that humans will always return to time and time again. For me, if I'm going to get a glimpse, I want specifics. That's the frustrating thing about Nostradamus for a lot of people. His wording and diction is like one of those 3D stereogram posters from the 90s. You can see their meaning and power, but only if you squint really hard, blur your vision, and maybe stand on one leg. In the end, looking back at how prophecy has been handled across the millennia, those of us who want it to be as easy as owning a copy of Gray's Sports Almanac from Back to the Future 2 are going to be sorely disappointed. The best anyone has ever been able to do honestly just feels like a good guess. Most of the time. I do think that there was something going on with Kenneth McKenzie, the brand seer, though. If he was a real historical figure, that is. Why? Well, it has to do with how his story really ends. Yes, he died in a horrible way, having his head dunked in a barrel of burning tar. But folks around Bran Castle felt his presence for many more years. For one, there's a monument stone down at Shannon Re Point, briefly telling his story. But then there's the Seaforth family line. You see, in 1781, the last Earl of Seaforth passed away without a son. His daughter, Caroline Mackenzie, lived at Bran Castle for a number of decades after that, but she tragically died in 1823 after being thrown from her horse. A distant, non-direct branch of the Mackenzies took over after that, but by 1923, they too were left without an heir. It seems that the Bran seer had been right, calling the shot before it ever happened. How? Well, we'll never know. But there's one thing I am certain of. Many years from now, far into the future, the people who live in the area around the ruins of Bran Castle will still be talking about him. And that's a guarantee. When he first appeared, it was in Welsh mythology as a warrior in the court of a 6th century chieftain. The way his story is told, he accompanied this ruler to battle. And when that chieftain was killed, our hero was so overcome with grief and despair that he ran off into the nearby forest of Caledonia, spending the next few decades living the life of a hermit or some sort of wild man of the woods. But that mental break that sent him running apparently did something else. It gifted him with the ability to prophesy about the future. 
Keep in mind, for a lot of cultures throughout history, there was a thin, permeable line between those suffering from madness and those seen as touched by the powers that be. And that was his story 1,500 years ago. When another writer, a Welsh monk named Nennius, arrived in the 9th century, he included this warrior prophet in his collection of historical tales called the History of the Britons. There, he was known as Ambrose, and his life was given some differences, most notably something that took place when he was a boy. It's said that a powerful warlord named Vortigern was trying to build a castle, but the work of his builders kept falling down. So he was told to consult Ambrose, then living as a boy with a reputation for prophecy. When asked about the trouble with building the castle, Ambrose told the warlord that the problem was actually below the foundation, deep inside the earth. It seems they were building over an ancient pool that contained two dragons, one red, one white. The dragons were soon uncovered, and after an intense battle with them, the red dragon won. Ambrose tells Vortigern that it's a prediction about the future battle between the Britons and the Saxons, and how the Britons would win. The 12th century writer Geoffrey of Monmouth is the next one to put this prophet into his work. His multi-volume collection, known as The History of the Kings of Britain, covers a lot of the same ground as his predecessors. Even the battle between the white and the red dragons makes another appearance. In Geoffrey's retelling of this prophet's life, though, some details are changed, and new ones are added in. For one, the boy prophet isn't consulted by Vortigern. He's captured on order of the court magicians to become a human sacrifice as a solution to the castle-building problems. It's only after the boy stands up to the magicians and the warlord, lecturing them on the true nature of their problem, that the pool and the dragons are revealed. And what was added? Well, it turns out that hundreds of this prophet's predictions are recorded in the book, making it clear that's how he was still viewed by people in the 1100s. After Geoffrey of Monmouth's depiction of this prophet, though, popular culture began to change him. Gone were the stories of his prophetic visions of the future, and in their place came intricate tales about magical powers. For example, he apparently once traveled to Ireland and used magic to steal a ring of giant stones and then moved them to Salisbury Plain, where they ended up becoming, you guessed it, Stonehenge. Oh, and he also helped another warlord, a guy named Uther Pendragon, find a wife and then give birth to a son, quite possibly fathered by this prophet, a son named Arthur. And there you go. How an ancient Welsh warrior was transformed over time from a prophet named Merthyn to a powerful magician named Merlin. Over the centuries, a number of other familiar pieces were added on, from a sword embedded in stone, a mysterious lady in the lake, and even the holy grail in the round table. It's fair to say that the Merlin of today looks nothing like the one who first appeared over 1,500 years ago. And that's the tricky part of folklore. Over time, it evolves and changes shape, becoming something new for a new generation, filling the gaps in each era's understanding of the world as it does. Which is why folklore can be described two ways. It's impervious to prediction, and it's very much like a box of chocolates. Because you never know what you're going to get. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching. Credits for today's episode are in the description below. Lore has been a podcast since 2015 with over 375 million downloads to date. You can learn more about this show over at lorepodcast.com. And of course, be sure to click the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to click the thumbs up. And you can also follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search for Lore Podcast, all one word, and then click that follow button. And when you do, say hi. I like it when people say hi. And as always, thanks for watching.